Welcome to Impact the World, a podcast from West Park Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is where we discuss topics related to how we can all love God, love people, and impact the world. Here's your host, Tara Hayes. Hi, I am Tara Hayes. I'm your host today on Impact the World. Uh, A few weeks ago, we sat down with a participant of Renewal, because this month our ministry focus is Renewal, and I'm very excited about what the Lord's doing in this ministry. And so, under duress, Scott Williams is back. (laughs) Hey, Scott. Hello, Targ. Still not wearing headphones. And I have another special guest with me today, David Jones. How are you, David? I'm doing well. Good. He currently has on headphones, but I'm not sure how long that'll that will last. We'll see. <laughs> not very long, probably. Um, but like I said, we sat down with Caitlin previously because we wanted to get the perspective of a person who has participated in renewal and see um, what the how the Lord used that to change her life. Today, I want to talk with David and Scott and get the perspective of a volunteer and um, somebody who's working in the ministry. David's going to um, share with us some about his testimony and why um, the Lord has brought him to renewal. And then we'll talk with Scott a little bit about the curriculum that God is using to draw those people into to change lives. So, David, what um, what would you say or like to share about the way that the Lord brought you to renewal? So my story is, I don't know, pretty interesting and unique, especially to uh, West Park. But um, when I was 19 years old, I was, well, actually before I was 19, when I was in late in high school, I started doing drugs and um, just not doing the things I should do. And and I moved out of my parents' house after graduation. Didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do with my life. Um, got I was very naive, very gullible, very easily peer pressured, and um, started selling drugs, mm. doing drugs, more drugs. And um, one night back in 1997, <laughs> um, I was a part of a serious crime that went. I went to the county jail, and they told me I was never going to get out of prison again. I wow. was charged with first-degree murder. How old were you at I that I was time? 19 years old. Oh. Um, especially aggravated robbery and aggravated robbery. So after sitting in the county jail for three years, almost three years, uh, with 23-hour lockdown, um, they finally came up to a deal, and uh, I was shipped off to Brushy Mountain with a 40-year sentence. Wow. Um, so I went to Brushy, spent a few months there, and then uh, end up going to Morgan County to spend the remaining of my time. Um, I ended up doing 13 years in prison uh, from the time I was 19. And I got out when I was 33, or right before I turned 33. Wow. And um, when I was locked up, I did a lot of soul searching. I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, so I, I, I tried to figure out what was going on, what got me to where I was at, because I, I grew up a good life. My parents mm-hmm. were both um, Christians. I was raised in the church. I was on mission trips. I've been on mission trips. I've been to church camps. And I think what happened was I lived in this bubble, and I just was told, like, you know, not to do this, not to do that, and I didn't know why. Right. And um, later on, and like I said, in high school, I was just starting to hang around with the wrong people and very easily peer pressured into doing things that I shouldn't have done. And it just kind of started spiraling and spiraling mm. down the wrong path. And then eventually it got to a point where, I mean, I was getting kicked out of apartments and houses and and uh, getting robbed and wow, uh, pistol whipped. and <laughs> You name it, it sounds yeah. like it happened. And, uh, and so a lot of just a lot of bad decisions, and then I ultimately accumulated into one night in uh, '97, where a young man lost his life, and I was mm-hmm. a part of it. Um, and I was just there; I was just a participant. I wasn't the person who did it. I was just All a right. participant, and and uh, I just remember at 19, my lawyer coming in there, the DA coming in there, and they pretty much told me I was never going to get out of prison again. Mm-hmm. And um, and I just felt lost. I felt. Hopeless. I mean, you had to think, 
how did I how did I end up here? How did I end up? Because here? you know we've all heard it said nobody wakes up and says today I'm going to become a criminal and I'm going to end up in jail. I mean, so it's that that first decision to do something that you think oh that's not really what I'm supposed to be doing, but you don't realize how far it can carry you. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. It didn't take long for me to do do the lifestyle to get into a place where I was locked up and and the consequences for doing the lifestyle. Yeah. I, you had to feel hopeless. I was. I was very lost and hopeless, scared. My parents were didn't know what to do. They were scared and and very worried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people I, if you hear your son's going to Brushy Mountain and then ends up, it's just not encouraging. Hey, do you mind sharing what you shared Monday night about you weren't the only one doing time? So, this is good. Okay. I was, um, so I, you know, I got my sentence, my 40 year sentence. And after a while, you just kind of get in a rhythm of doing time. Uh, mm-hmm. You just kind of get in a rhythm of what you do every day. And um, I went through a lot of struggles still because I really didn't think I was going to get out. Um, and uh, I just remember um, giving my parents, even at that time, giving them a hard time, and they would come visit me. And and um, I would just look at my parents and say, well, I'm the one doing time in here. And my mom finally looked at me and she said, you're not the only one doing time. We're doing it with you. Wow. And uh, and, and, and things like that just kind of impacted me because I, I – I realized what my what I had put my family through, what I was putting my family, my friends, my brother through. Um, they had to come visit me. They had to give up weekends to come visit me. And, yeah, they were feeling the consequences as well. Yeah, they had to come to my parole hearings. They had to uh, go without um, Christmases and Thanksgivings yeah. and, and stuff. So they had just had to watch me grow up in – in prison. in prison, yeah, but it's hard at that age too. It's probably hard to really realize that until your mother put it that way, because you're like, I'm the one sitting in jail. Yeah, my mom is very good <laughs> at being blunt and telling me what I need to hear. So. She's speaking the truth in love. <laughs> my parents are definitely two of my heroes. They mm-hmm. never gave up on me. They always um, kept me sort of connected with the outside world. Uh, made sure I had visits. Made sure I had. Christmas cards, birthday cards, uh, made sure I felt love, made sure I had prayers. Wow. Um, they just all, they were there for me. That's know? awesome. And and I think we'll talk a little bit later about families Yes, that are kind of in the same situation, that have kids that are, have or brothers or sisters or spouses that have ended up someplace they don't want them to be you know whether that's addicted to a substance or in prison but we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later so what brought you through that point of you know like you said you have time you're sitting in jail you you're getting used to just the day-to-day routine you're doing a lot of soul searching searching so what is it what was the turning point like you said you'd grown up in a Christian home mm-hmm. so what at what point? Was there a person or a situation that brought you back to? There was definitely a situation. I think it was my <laughs> fourth parole hearing, and um, I went up, and they told me they were. I I think I had done ten or six years at the time, mm-hmm. six or seven years, and um, they put me off for another ten years. And oh. at, at that point, I thought I'm I'm not going to get out of here. I'm going to be old and this mm-hmm. and. And uh, and I just went. I just remember going back to my cell, and just kind of giving up. And mm. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done at that time, because <laughs> um, you can still get things in prison. Uh, and so, yeah. And then it, and it, I just had to come to a realization after going through my breakdown. This is what got me here. Why am I still doing this? Oh. And um, <laughs> and I had to look around. I mean, I was in a little eight by 10 cell. And I had to look around and say, this is not where I want to be, but this is where I am, but I can make it a better life. And, uh, I started getting involved in, uh, some programs in prison. Uh, I started becoming a facilitator in programs in prison. Uh, I went and actually got a a little degree in prison (laughs) and, uh, I was just, I kept myself active in my job there, um, on the rec yard. And I had a job at one point where I was 
orientating new mm -hmm. inmates, and I would try to tell them about all the new programs, all the programs going on to get themselves involved. Yeah. Uh, just because I thought to myself, if you know, I might not be able to get out of here, but I can help somebody else either change their life or, or yeah. help them get out of here. Yeah. And uh, and so that's kind of what the turning point was. And, uh, wow, I love that you that kind of snapped you into wait. I, if I keep doing the same thing I've always done, I'm always going to feel the same, going to have the same outlook. Nothing's going to change. And I, that's definitely the Holy Spirit working. It, it was, definitely. <laughs> it was not me. <laughs> yeah, that's not, it's not a flesh decision, is it? Mm. So what facilitated you? Clearly, you're not serving 40 years in Morgan County, so how did we get to where we are today? So um, after they gave me... It put me out for 10 years. There was a lot of things with courts that I don't even know all the issues, but it somehow there came to a ruling where they couldn't put you off over six years. Mm. So I had to have another parole hearing. And uh, when I went back, I think it was a year after or two years after, they put me off five. Um, and so at that time, it's I'm still doing time. And they, they actually, in 2008, they moved me to a – the annex, which is the lower security, minimum security. And so I got to the annex, and this was pretty unique. I was, I, I had a buddy who had been locked up about 30 years, and he got me a job with him, and we were going to the warden's office and working around the warden, cleaning the offices, and just kind of rubbing shoulders with the warden and all the big time <laughs> staff of the prison. And I was, I was going with him on Fridays to uh, the warden's house. We were cleaning the house. Wow. And I, I really felt like I was in a surreal position. Yeah. Did you feel like, I feel like I'm part of a movie right now yeah. or something like felt, that. I kind of felt like Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Where I'm <laughs> okay, just I'm like, glad you said yeah. that because I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking it. That's so bad. <laughs> but it was pretty unique. Like we would go to the house on Fridays and we would just kind of clean his house, do little chores for him because he worked at the prison all the time. And then he'd come home and I remember he, his wife and him, they came home and they made a dinner for us and we sat down and they actually prayed with us and wow. they were saying a prayer for my buddy and I. And I just remember looking up and saying, this is not, what this is going not on happening. here. And, um, but just things like that. And then just being at the annex and finally in 2010, um, they, they were, had another parole hearing and, I kind of had mixed emotions about it. I didn't really expect them to let me out just because they hadn't done it yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you had been in that position I'd multiple been, times. I've been denied at least five times by then. Mm. So I just thought, wow. you know what? It's probably going to be another year or two. And um, my parents were very hopeful. I just didn't want to get my hopes up. And I just I remember going you. into the parole hearing and I had um, – good support group there and and I remember talking to him and um, I remember one of the parole officers or the board members saying well, Mr. Jones um, I'm gonna take a leap of faith I'm gonna give you my vote and I needed three votes and then the other one was there and he said he did his little spiel <laughs> and then he said I'm gonna go along with my colleague and I'm gonna take a leap of faith too and I'm gonna give you a vote so I already had two right there, and I think within three days I had another vote, wow. and they had my day out, and it was I, it was still a surreal moment because I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea. I didn't grow up um, out here in the free world, yeah. and so I'd been locked yeah. up my whole adult life. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to do, um, and I kind of came to the realization too at that point that you know I've been living this life in here um, as a, I guess, a good person, now the test is going to come. Right. I'm going to get out. And because were you cultivating a relationship with, with the Lord while you oh, were in definitely, prison? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, I was uh, I, like I said, I was facilitating Celebrate Recovery in there. Uh, I was attending. I, I attended AA in there for a little bit, and then I moved to Celebrate Recovery. I did uh, Seven Steps, and I was facilitating Seven Steps anger management programs. I was facilitating programs. 
I don't even know if I was qualified to still say. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask, but the let Lord me, put you in that position, didn't yes. he? I, let me ask you one question. If you, looking back on your experience, if there is one thing that where you said you kind of tapped and said, okay, Lord, I give. Mm. I'm ready to do what your will for my life is. Is there one big thing, a bunch of little things, or how did you? There's a couple get to of different. Ep- uh, there's a couple of different things. Like when I was first put in the county jail, pacing back and forth in that little six by nine cell in Knox County Jail, which is dirty and nasty and loud, and I just remember falling on my knees saying, "What happened? Where am I at? What did I do?" Uh, kind of just giving my life to God then, just crying tears. Mm. And then I went to prison. And then you kind of get into the daily life of prison, and you kind of get hopeless again. You feel lonely. You don't think you're going to get out. So you, you just kind of do what you need to do. And um, But then I think that parole hearing that I was talking about earlier um, was really a, a huge kicker um, of, of, of me really turning my – not only my life, but I think my attitude mm. toward everything. Which and is so, a key. Yeah, and saying, you know what? I might not get out of here for 10 years, but I can be the the person that God wants me to be mm. wherever I am. Mm. And yeah. uh, didn't, definitely didn't want to spend 10, year, 10 more years in there. <laughs> but And that's kind of the way I felt. I was like, you know what? If I can help somebody else, then this is what I need to be doing. So I think that, that was a big kicker. Not saying I... Didn't have any other kickers after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that was a big one because I just, I think that was the, the point where I was like, I can go down. I can, there's two paths I can go down. I can be, I can go down this path and be worse off, or I can go down th- this path and, and just try to make my life better. And yeah. I just decided, you know what? I need to make my life better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. And it didn't really matter where I was at. Yeah, that's a big thing. Well, and I think that's the key. You have to realize it doesn't matter. Like you said, I can do that here just like I can do it anywhere. Um, So, yeah, I'm sure that was a real turning point that the Lord used. So then you had a day that you knew, I'm I'm getting out of prison. And so that had to be, I think for me, that would have been frightening because you're used to, like you said, you're doing the day in and day out. They tell me when I... When to unlock my door, when to come out, when to lock yeah. back up. And, and that's everything as an adult. You've learned how to do that in prison. So then here you are, and you're free. What happened after that? So my mom came and picked me up, and um, I was walking down the aisle, like the big hallway. Uh, and I'd walked down this hallway many times because I used to clean it. And uh, I was walking out, and I just remember – the staff from the um, administration staff that I used to work around for two years, they came out and they were shaking my hand and oh, giving me hugs, wow. and I was just ready to get out. I was like, oh, I need to get out of here <laughs> before you change your mind is what <laughs> <Yeah>. I felt. <laughs> before and, um, they figure out what they've done. I just remember my mom was so nervous driving home. Another lady who I love dearly came to pick me up, and she was telling my mom, hey, do I need to drive for you? And and when we just drove out of Morgan County and then just kept driving, I just, it was, it was, I hate to keep using this word, but surreal, yeah. but it was just a surreal moment because I was like, at any moment, they're going to bring me back. I was supposed to be going to a halfway house because they said I was institutionalized, so I wasn't even going to my parents' house. Oh, wow. Um, but they were going to let me spend a little bit of time with my parents before I had to go there. And I remember my mom taking me to, Turkey Creek Walmart. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Talk about sensory yes. overload. It is for uh, a person who hasn't been in prison. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, cuz I didn't have anything and yeah. uh, she's she, I just remember her we getting there my dad met me there and we were all there and hugging and stuff and and my mom was like, "What do you need?" And I said, "I don't, uh, I don't know." Everything. You tell me. <laughs> what do I yeah. I I remember her saying I, I remember saying, "Well, I need shaving cream." And uh so she she takes me to the shaving cream aisle. There's an aisle. And I would mm-hmm. I, and when I was locked up I had like two options. So she takes me to the shaving cream aisle and she's like, "Which one do you want?" I said, "I don't uh, know. Get whatever dad gets." Yeah. I, I had no idea. I didn't want that was too many options, too many yeah. too many things. It's and, definitely a culture shock. Yeah, yeah. And then even clothes, I mean, I wore jeans with a stripe down the leg and a pullover smock. For yeah. 13 years, you know, I was like, I don't know what people wear out here. 
it was very eye opening, wow. very yeah. frightening. Like you said, it was it was a culture shock. I was so used to one thing, and this is a random question, but does that after being in that position, does that help you understand why so many so many people are incarcerated a second time because it's I think, stressful I think for them people, to. I think people get used to it. I think they everything's provided for them. Yeah. Everything's kind of given to them as far and I hate to say it like that, but I mean they're told when where to go to work. They're told um, when to go eat. Well, yeah, I mean you know, it relieves the pressure to to of trying yeah. to figure out what you're going to do with your life. You don't, you don't have to pay bills. Yeah, I mean really, honestly, when I woke up in the morning, I'd go to work, and then I'd come back. We'd have count time, so I'd sit in my room, and then we'd have dinner, and then I would go to the ball field, and I would work out, or I would play basketball, or I'd, I'd play, you know, yeah. and then I'd get locked back up. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So being then at the Walmart in Turkey Creek <laughs> had to really be, okay, Lord, you've got to continue to direct me to help me know what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so tell a little bit about how that went after you. So I got, so I'm, I'm in the halfway house and I'd already done a lot of these programs with the focus prison ministry. And so I went to their halfway house and, and, um, I didn't, I I was able to graduate early. And so I was able to go back to my parents' house the week before Christmas of December, 2010, um, so that was exciting. I got yeah. to, go, you know, to my first Christmas with my family in 13 years. And then, um, and then just kind of, I was working. I already had a job lined up. I, I mean, I had a lot of resources and people that were, were rooting for me. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and we'll kind of talk about yeah. that again with the renewal. Had a job and, <clears throat> and I worked and I just kept on, I went back to uh, Pellissippi and got a degree, a associate's degree in business management. Awesome. And, uh, you know, I, where I was working at, I was able to meet my wife. And Oh, good. I'm we, glad you told us. Because I was like, <laughs> how did you meet Ashley? <laughs> we, she was back in school, and, and we were able to um, connect, and we, we were able to get married. And, and uh, But it was the kind of funny thing is, like, now i got to tell people out here about my life <laughs> yeah. and what I've been through and, and how are they going to react and how are they going to accept me. Uh, because when we got married or when we were looking to get married, I, they weren't letting me get an apartment building or apartment oh. because of my record. Cause I'm still on parole. Mm. Um, they, you know, some, some jobs wouldn't let me come to work for them cause I was still on parole. So I really had to just kind of reach out and, and ask for help and favors. And, and, uh, luckily enough, the job I have now, a friend of mine, um, she, put a good word in and I just went in there and it was very open and honest and and uh they told me they were going to give me a try and nine years later I'm still there that's and, fantastic and it's, been, it's been great and it supports my family and me and and uh here we are now wow <laughs> and I've been out for 12 years I've got two beautiful girls and you know God has really blessed me more than I deserve mm. and I know that I when I got out I I just remember being very grateful of all the small things that I missed out on as far as I'll tell you a story. Okay. <laughs> the first morning when I was in the halfway house, I woke up and I went out to the front yard of the halfway house. And I remember drinking my cup of coffee and just listening and seeing the trees and listening to the birds, seeing the squirrels, listening to the traffic. And I, I thought to myself, I said, this is beautiful. Mm. And then I thought to myself, God just got me through 13 years of prison without being stabbed, oh. without being raped, without being physically, like oh. really physically harmed, um, without being, me- you know, just messed up from drugs or, or you know, too messed up from anything, um, bitter, all that stuff. You know, yeah. He got me through all that stuff. Here I am now. And so I was like, I can go to the refrigerator and get what I want to eat. I can, you know, and it's just I can go to my parents' house and visit. Yeah, it was just all the small things that I've, that I think a lot of people, and even now, you know, twelve years out, sometimes I take for granted. But I was like, man, this is like, 
what I was living for. Yeah. And now it's, I get to do it. I love that you said that because I think it's all, I was thinking that as you were saying that it's all the little things that so many times we take for granted, but whether we've been in prison or not, those are things God has given each of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, his grace gives us the very breath in our lungs, Mm -hmm. the ability to get up and enjoy a cup of coffee. I mean, he gives us all of that. And that is amazing. That's amazing. I, I I like to think of you know, and we we all have our own shoes to walk in. We don't know what somebody else is walking in. And the person next to you might be having a hard time at work or in life or in their marriage and and um everybody's going through something. Everybody's dealing with something. And uh that's why I say you gotta take you gotta be grateful for all the little things. Like you said, going and getting a cup of coffee. My mom would for years all she wanted me to do was sit down when I got out, have a cup of coffee with her. Mm. And so now, even now, 12 years later, I go to my mom's house and she watches the girls. And I, when I pick them up, I have a cup of coffee with her and we just talk and visit. And it's what my mom wanted. And I'm like, yeah. you know what? This I'm is happy to I'm give, give it to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like all the small things that I don't know what anybody is going on unless I ask them. But I, I guarantee you, if we were just all to focus on, you know, God got me up this morning mm-hmm. and... I might not have I might not have a, a job to go to, but I know God's going to take care of me. Or I might not have this going on, or or whatever. You know, yeah. I do have a lot of things I should be grateful for. It's so true. It's so true. It's that perspective. Like you mentioned earlier, your attitude changing, and I think um, you know God changing that, and then having that perspective makes such a difference. I think it's pretty evident why you've been drawn to renewal. Um, so how long have you been, at what point did you find out about Renewal? How did you get involved? I can't remember how I found out. I think Al. <laughs> probably taught, probably taught Pastor Al. It. He'll tell everybody everything. <laughs> and he, he got me into it, and I was coming for a little bit a couple years ago. And then uh, and then my job changed, and I was working a lot of nights, and I was not, not able to make it. But it was always kind of in my it was in my heart. And then my job went back to what it was before beginning of last year and that's one thing I wanted to get back into so I started doing renewal and um and I love going because I think that's the people that I can talk to uh, even feel comfortable with you know yeah. it's like I we, everybody has struggles like I said yeah. and it's a community I I just heard Caitlin's uh podcast and and nobody's really judgmental. You just go yeah. in there. Every you know, you have we have life dominating sins. Everybody does. Um, there should be more people in renewal. Honestly, uh, <laughs> yes, I agree, one hundred percent. But there's people there that also want to help. I mean, I'm not, I'm not fixed. You know, I'm yeah. not totally. Uh, there's things that I struggle with, and in times where I'm just like, you know, I don't have that positive attitude, but I can go to renewal and I can get that encouragement and that help and just talking with people and sharing my yeah. story helps me remember, oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is what God's done this for is me. What he's done for and me. I, exactly. Yeah. I gotta keep living my life out in obedience. Wow. Well, I I love that you're a part of the renewal uh ministry. And I love that you feel comfortable and can share and um God has great things, has already done great things and continues to and has great things for you in that ministry. I so appreciate you sharing your story. Well, it, um, I appreciate you having me here. I'm not well, used to the microphone and the headphones. <laughs> You're like a natural. <laughs> Scott's over there shaking his head. He doesn't. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I do like about Renewal, too, is that uh, they do provide a good meal. And oh. you can come in and you can... That is what I've heard. You can yeah, eat. very good. And uh, my, my my girls love going to Renewal, and it's easy for me because they can. there's dinner prepared, and they love the child care that's provided, uh, just playing with the other kids. And, and I, you know, I, I want them to meet a, a, yeah. everybody else. I want them to meet people and say, hey, you know what? These people are, you know, you need to meet everybody, you know, yeah. and, and get to know... What, what's going on out there? Yeah. So. Oh, I love that because it is important to help your kids realize there are other kids in s- different situations and you're, you're living in a good situation now, but you know, he, your dad's got a past. Everybody's got a past. Everybody. 
and or something that they're struggling with and they need that will help them be able to relate with them and i think that's fantastic and i love that you brought up the child care because i think that's important for people to realize that there are if you think that you need to be in renewal, and like David said, more people <laughs> need to be in renewal, probably myself, but um, there really are no excuses. I mean, there's child care, and just unless your schedule doesn't work, but mm. I mean, you're provided a meal, there's child care, and that community is so important. Yeah. So, so important. Yeah. Let me give a plug for our child care. Um, just, I'll mention first names, but they, they do awesome and make the kids want to come. I know my boys, if they have a game or something and have to miss, it, it breaks their heart. I mean, they love going to renewal because of the child care. And That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's really good. So, you know, we've got Rose, and we've got Selena, and we've got Brett, and then Noah – Helps. Hey, that's a great group. I I'm know all of them. You. So they, they do a fantastic job, and I know that I don't tell them enough, but we appreciate them so much for the good job they do. So, well, they're, that, yeah, they're that's awesome. awesome. Well, again, I just really appreciate you sharing your story and what brought you there and how instrumental, just how the Lord has worked every step of your story. And now you're using that to help people. You're still working. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're all... He'll still be working on all of us till he decides to take us home. But that's that's a good segue into talking about the curriculum. And I know you wanted to touch on that, Scott, just what you use um, during your meetings on Monday nights. Yes, and and I'm that's one thing that I really love about Renewal is um, we don't work through steps or anything. So um, we will use just different books. We don't have a set curriculum that everybody uses, you know, at the same time, but um, there's freedom with each leader of um, classes to um, pray about, look for material, and uh, we're using something uh, by Mark Shaw right now, who if you never heard of Mark Shaw, mm, Google He's amazing. Yes, he is awesome. So um, we, we have the men's group, we have the women's group, um, and I'm going to give Dr. Al Cage a plug here. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that's why I asked David to share a little bit about his mom and, and that she was serving time also while mm -hmm. David was. It's because Al is doing a class for family, loved ones, friends. Um, it would be a class for like David's mom, mm. who is having to walk that road watching someone they care about in addiction, um, in prison. So there are a ton of those people, yeah. and um, I don't think a lot of them know how to get help. They just right. bottle it in. So Al well, does— Well, and don't you think so many of them are trying to think, how can I get my son, brother, or whoever, how can I get them help? Yes. Not really stopping to think about, I need to process yeah, this too. Absolutely. Yes, yes, great point. Um, because they are suffering. They're going yeah. through it. And that's what Al does so well. And, I mean, he did this years ago. And we kind of took a break from it after COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody loved it so much because they didn't know that they needed help. But we would tell them, hey, come check out this class where you've got a loved one who is in some mm -hmm. life-dominating sin. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't know what to do? Come to this class. So... Al does a wonderful job with taking the Word of God and walking through it to show people this is what's going on with your son, daughter, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, best friend, yeah. and show them through the Word of God. And, and we talked about our curriculum. We do have, um, you know, we the, the leaders have freedom to pick what they want to use, but our main curriculum is the Word of God. Yeah, That is what we turn to. Um, like I said, we don't do a step a step program here at Renewal um, because we know that God's Word has every answer answer for any spiritual problem that that we may come upon. And you know, I, I think what I love about David coming so much is because of of his story. And a lot of times we'll get people and we'll tell them we'll sit down and show them what the Word of God says, and they think, "Yeah, but I'm in so deep." that, you know, that just sounds too easy. And, and David shares his testimony of someone who was going to be in prison possibly for the rest of his life and that God knew exactly where he was, 
mm-hmm. and God had other plans, and that when you turn to God for help and His Word, there's no telling what He's going to do. Right. So that's what I love about David. He op- did our opening last week, and mm-hmm. I'm I'm uh, gigging him just a little bit to <laughs> to lead the men's class here pretty soon. So I just appreciate David being there. He is a blessing to everyone at Renewal. Well, he's been a blessing today to me yes. in this episode. But I love that you made a point to say that Scripture is really your key curriculum yes. because we know as we live in obedience to Jesus Christ and His commands in Scripture, that is what transforms our lives. Yes. It changes the heart, which changes our actions, which changes everything. And... um so I love that. I love that you're starting that class back again, too, because I yes. think that's going to be really an excellent resource, but it's really important for yes. people to know, yeah, I mean, this is difficult. You may not be the one that's addicted or incarcerated or whatever, but you you need to understand the scriptural scriptural point of view from, you know, for you and what you're going through as well. Yeah. Wow. So... <laughs> There's a windstorm outside of you guys if that picked up on the on the um, microphones. But um, I I've really enjoyed this conversation today about renewal. I just think it's such an important ministry, and I want everybody to know about it because I think more and more we are being touched by addictions of all kinds, and um, if you're not addicted. To something you probably know somebody who is or has been in a situation like David so I think renewal is just a very important ministry that God's using for sure Amen. so renewal meets on Monday nights in the hub at six o'clock it starts at six that's when the dinner starts correct that's when dinner starts okay well you you don't want to be late for that no <laughs> But if you have more questions about Renewal, you can uh, jump on our website. I'll put that link in the show notes. You can find out more about Renewal, but it meets every Monday night. Yes. Basically without exception, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They're not taking breaks. So um, I'm sure they would love to see anybody that feels like it would be a ministry for them. Well, you guys, thanks again for coming today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having us again. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we hope that uh, the conversation that we had today was an encouragement to you. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Impact the World. To find out more about West Park Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, visit westparkbaptist.org.